Hello everybody, welcome to Asarasi Bucket. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and drop a like on this video. I am trying to hit 100k subscribers on this channel by the end of the playoffs, so your subscription would be much appreciated. Also drop a like, only takes one second and it makes a massive difference. It's been a while since we've done this, but it's hot takes, you know what it is, so let's get into it. Jokic is better right now than Dirk ever was. Um, I feel like this is a take that is going, that is hot, but probably shouldn't be. Granted, the difference isn't so significant that it's like obvious, but uh, if you look in the numbers, like Jokic is obvious, the passing, duh. Uh, Jokic this year is a far better defender than Dirk has ever been at any point in his career. Um, from a mid-range shooting perspective, obviously Dirk wins that based on volume, but if you look at percentages, they actually have... Like, there is a mild edge in Jokic's favor percentage-wise, but his volume is so much significantly lower. Like, Jokic over the last two years shoots like 4% better from mid-range from both spots uh, than Dirk, but he shoots 30% less mid-range shots. So, can't really say that he wins that one, but I will just say Jokic is a phenomenal mid-range shooter himself. Three-point numbers are relatively similar. Uh, I'd argue Jokic is a better finisher in the paint, more touch around the rim, more of a physical presence. Again, way better defender, uh, astronomically better playmaker. I would give that edge to Jokic personally. Now, all-time ranking-wise, I'm putting Dirk higher, obviously, because Jokic has the longevity. But if we're just looking at them as pure talents, Jokic over the last two years is probably one of the... I don't know, what do we say, like 20 most talented players of all time? And maybe peak Dirk was in that category too, but uh, I feel like Jokic would be a little bit higher, at least for their peak for peak anyways. From Harden Sexual, the Nets will not make the playoffs. Uh, there's a chance they're gonna get in the play-in tournament, but so long as everyone's healthy for the play-in tournament, they're gonna be just fine. They're, they're definitely going to make the playoffs and I really hope they actually end up having a higher seed because there's a real chance that my Bulls have the one or two seed. And if I have to play the Nets in the first round, I'm going to be fucking pissed off, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. There is a non-zero chance that we look back at the Zabonis trade in a few years and think, think the Kings did all right. A non-zero chance, sure. I mean, there's a non-zero chance that one day I am married to Haley Williams, but that doesn't mean that it's really worthy of note because it's not going to happen. The, the only way this happens is if the all-star potential that Tyrese Halliburton very clearly displayed if you actually watched him play, the only way that this is a, not a bust is if that just completely falls flat, if he just ends up being an okay player for the rest of his career. But I am very, very confident that he is going to be an all-star caliber guy. And on top of the fact that, again, I talked about this in my Traded Lines winners and losers or grades video or whatever. Uh, seven years of Tyrese Halliburton versus potentially just two years of Sabonis. I'm taking the seven years of Halliburton. I already don't even think there's that significant of a gap between them as talents. I think Sabonis is probably like 25% better. Son of a bitch. I really got to stop setting alarms for a schedule that I don't even adhere to. It's just, they just interrupt the videos all the time now. Uh, but the point I was making, uh, Sabonis, in two years, Tyrese Halliburton's going to be better. And he's going to be under contract after then. So, no. I'm tired of people being fucking contrarians about this move. The Kings lost it. I don't care that Sabonis is better right now. We all pretty much agreed with that. And a bunch of Kings fans tagging me in posts about the fact that Sabonis had a good game. What the fucking do? That's not the point. That's not the point anyone was making. You gave up an incredibly good asset to get marginally better. You're, you, you lost the trade. And I also don't know why you're, as a Kings fan, constantly defending a front office that consistently fails you. Why do you defend a front office move that's bad? I never fuck- I, well, I did a little bit. But I didn't really defend guard packs when they were consistently shitting the fucking bed because I want what's good for my franchise. So constantly defending their poor moves makes no goddamn sense to me. Anyways, Anthony Simons is going to be a superstar. Um, you know... It's kind of hard to look at like a 6'3", 6'4", guard who in the 22 games that he's starting has averaged 23 and 6 and shot 41% from 3 on 10 attempts per game while statistically being the highest percentage pull-up 3-point shooter in the game. To look at a 22-year-old guard doing that, it's 
kind of difficult to say that you know there's a cap on that potential that keeps him out of a superstar category because kind of what i just described to you sounds like a damian lillard type of player ironically uh and for him to be doing this at that age i feel like the sky is the limit i would not bank on him being a superstar just because hey, that's that's a tough thing to bank on with anybody but yeah he has that potential for sure. One way or the other, he has the potential. Philadelphia did not get as good as many people say they did. They gave up Drummond, who is a decent backup five, and Curry, who was a big part of their offense and played off ball like unlike Harden. Uh, so first of all, a decent backup center is the most replaceable position in all of basketball. A decent backup center is constantly available on the buyout market. It's just, there's always decent backup centers. It's the most replaceable position in all of the game. So to that end, who gives a fuck? Uh, on top of that, Seth Curry, yeah, better three-point shooter than James Harden, better off-ball player than James Harden. James Harden is a significantly better on-ball player by a country mile. Uh, on top of the fact that, like, I understand the, the value of off-ball movement is very significant to me. But at the same time, the thing the Sixers have been lacking for years has been a shot-creating ball handler. They only had it briefly with Jimmy Butler, and he wasn't a three-point shooter. I saw a post, literally, like, it was just a, a footage of James Harden practicing with the Sixers. And it was a Sixers fan that said, like, I forgot it was possible for players to be able to both shoot and dribble. Like, the Sixers have this history the past couple of years of having ball handlers who can't shoot or shooters who cannot ball handle they have both now and it's good the, the the sixers got much better i don't know i feel like there's so many fucking contrarian takes lately that are like we all agreed on this and then you just had to be different for all the people saying the sixers didn't get better you're out of your fucking mind uh that you just are a D andre drummond are you fucking kidding me a backup center? Are you fucking kidding me? Sign Tristan Thompson. Sign Robin Lopez. Boom. You're right back where you were in that r regard. Even fucking Paul... Uh, what's his name? The Sixers fans call him B-Ball Paul. Why can't I remember his goddamn name? He's already been pretty good as their backup center. It's really not an important position. Especially come playoff time when Joel Embiid's going to be playing 40 minutes a game. So, uh, yeah. No stupid the nuggets are massively underrated at the current moment with jamal murray coming back sometime pretty soon after all-star and mpj looking like he's going to be back before the playoffs the nuggets will be up there with the suns and the warriors as the top west teams yeah i think this is completely true i feel like the fact that both of those guys should be back before the end of the year has gone completely under the radar granted uh first of all michael porter jr was awful this year when he was playing but you know part of that was because he was dealing with an injury but could be a factor uh getting those guys in and getting them acclimated and getting the system back to what it really can be at its peak potential is unlikely in the short of a span that they're going to have but they're not a team that i'd want to face uh i would still bet on the suns and the warriors over them for sure but then after that it's kind of anybody's race in the western conference and a healthy nuggets team probably wins that race uh and if they could get acclimated sooner rather than later, then they're a serious threat. But I really feel like that team is heavily contingent on chemistry. And if they don't have the time to get the chemistry back to what it was for those like 15 or so games when everyone was healthy before uh, Jamal tore his ACL, um, that team is scary. But I don't know that they're going to have that chemistry quite in time for the playoffs. And I feel like before they figure it out, they're going to get knocked out. But either way, the Nuggets and their return from injuries has not been factored in as much as it probably should be. Jalen Brown is better than Jason Tatum. I am so sick and fucking tired of this take when the standards that are held for each of these players are so contrary to this notion. This is essentially the uh, Dame is better than Steph Curry thing where people make this bullshit claim and then look where the standards lie. Jason Tatum, when he has a bad stretch, that's all anyone talks about. Jalen Brown has bad stretches and bad games just as frequently, if not more frequently, than Jason Tatum. In fact, it is very common to see a game where Jalen Brown is like 2 for 17. Like, he has some 
awful shooting games under his sleeve. Two for 17 was an exaggeration. Or like, let's say three for 12. But he has games like that all the time. All the time. And does not get that same level of criticism of Jason Tatum. Why? Because we know and expect more of Jason Tatum because he's a better basketball player. Same thing with that Dame versus Steph thing. Dame is not held to the same regard, to the same standard as Steph Curry, because we actually know who's better. You only have these bullshit takes when one player is on and one player is off. But when it comes to the reality of the situation, Jason Tatum is better. Jason Tatum is held to a higher standard because we know he's better and has been the entire time. I don't really understand where this take comes from. It's not even fucking close to me. Like, really, it's not. Uh, the box score stuff might show you it's the same, but I promise you they're not the same fucking player. Jason Tatum's a way more on-ball player. He's significantly more of a leader, both in terms of how he plays and just how he communicates, how he play makes. How he defends, he's a better defender than Jalen Brown, even though people would give Jalen Brown a defensive rep reputation and not Jason, even though Jason is a pretty significantly better defender. No, Jalen Brown is not better than Jason Tatum, and I'm fucking tired of hearing it. The Serge Ibaka acquisition for DiVincenzo will end up being one of the worst moves of the deadline. Yeah, I do think there's a world where that move blows up in Milwaukee's face. I feel like there's a chance they just gave up on DiVincenzo's uh, return from injury a little bit too fast. Uh, and Serge Ibaka could end up being a corpse. We have, we'll have to wait and see because it's been up and down with him on the Clippers. I believe he's played with the Bucks already, but I haven't seen how that went. Uh, I think they were running lineups with him and Bobby Portis, which like, what the fuck is that? Either way, there's a potential that Dante DiVincenzo ends up being like a 15, five and four guy who's a really, really good defender and pretty efficient. And you gave that up as a young piece in exchange for an old man, Serge Ibaka, whose name does not carry the weight that it used to. So, gotta really hope that, in, in, in order for this move to look right, that DiVincenzo doesn't end up being that great, and that Serge Ibaka ends up being bringing a lot more positive to the table than he potentially could be. Luca will leave the Mavs after his new contract ends. Yeah, I'm pretty confident that's what's going to happen. I talk about the Mavs in today's main channel video, so go check that out when it comes out. Harden won't adapt well when he gets to Philly because he still wants to be the ball-dominant shot chucker and there'll be another second-round exit. James Harden is one of the best and most prolific playmakers in basketball, and you're not a shot chucker if you're efficient. And even though James Harden's efficiency has been down this year, historically, he has been very efficient for someone who shoots the ball as much as he does. The... Shot chucker label belongs to players who don't make their shots. You're only a chucker if they're not going in. Otherwise, you're just someone who shoots the ball a lot because you're fucking good. So, shot chucker, no. Ball dominant, yes, but he's not like a ball hog. I don't understand where that criticism comes from. He was like leading the league in assists this year or something close to it. Uh, not to mention the Sixers, what they need is a ball dominant player who shoots the ball a lot on the perimeter. That's what they've been wanting. I don't understand these people. James Harden on the Sixers is a good move. Shut the fuck up. This is a very frustrating one. This video is longer than it should be, but a lot of very unnecessarily contrarian takes. Anyways, uh, that is it. Goodbye.